Hello and welcome to the Team Peach Team Peachtree channel. Wow, I see there are five people here. When I started, there were zero. So good to have you here. Um, I know it is quite late in uh, places like Connecticut. So apologies for that. Uh, but you can always watch this on replay. I do want to start off with showing you. Hey, Lisa. Uh, I, I do want to start off with um, showing you just a couple of photos. Sharon, good to see you as well. Um, showing you a few photos from all. Um, I think I've got to do something. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Um, I, was, I guess I was going to talk to myself for a while. I do want to show a couple of photos from all, um, such as this. And uh, th that is, I think, one of the first scenes I saw um, because it was around the corner from where I was staying. And, and ironically, it's one of the first well-known paintings from all that, that Vincent van Gogh painted. So this is the very same bridge uh, that, that he painted um, when he was there. Uh, he has Langlois Bridge at all with women washing. Um, and then the date, does it give the date? It doesn't give the date. But um, yeah, a stone sort of bridge here, and this is obviously preserved. I'll, I'll be showing you other images of that, um, of, of that bridge. Uh, that, that's kind of another angle from sort of down at grass level. And I did actually take some photos, sorry, I took some video lying in the grass sort of with my back on the ground, just of the blades of grass blowing in the wind. I guess I was trying to channel Van Gogh. And I um, also had my straw hat. So it was sort of like this this kind of effect. The straw hat actually comes from the old garb, comes from Portugal, right? And I happened to just take it with me through the trip. I didn't really plan to, but I ended up just taking it all along. And then, um, yeah, I took this video um, and and you've really got to see this video just to see how the, how beautiful it is, how the sun um, reflects off these newly sprung, newly um, seeded um, grass grass heads, and um, it looks like the first day. It feels in in a way like the first day in the world. Everything is so fresh and and green and clean and pure and and um you know it's got that sort of um nature's first green is gold sort of vibe to it right yeah i don't i don't think i had the hat on when i went to the went to this grass but i was sort of walking around with it here and there so that's that, those are some of the images let's just see if there's any more that i want to show you um I'll obviously take you through it. Uh, I stayed quite close to this canal. If I can bring it up. There's another image of, not quite sure why it's not downloading this. Anyway, I, I guess I can show it to you from this perspective. You can see some of these grass heads kind of up close with the um, with the uh, with a bridge in the background. You can see it's got those two. Um, I'm not sure what you even call them. Um, Yeah, whatever they are. It's <laughs> not uh, sort of a cantilevering situation. And then, yeah, that's sort of the view from that, uh, from the from the grass level. And and I was trying to channel Van Gogh, so I was trying to see the scene through his, um, um, you know, his mind and his spirit. So that that was sort of the idea. 
and um, I found this quite a quite a powerful moment, just quite quite stunning. Uh, who else is here? Kathy, uh, that's for sure. Um, Angela says, I would love to go there. Well, why not? So the other thing I wanted to show you is the um, a little video clip that just takes us into this part of the story. And it's from Painted with Words. I'm going to put the sound off uh, and then just talk you guys through it. So this is from Painted with Words. And this is basically just the, um, the what, what, where we are in the story. You can see he's drinking and not getting along with Theo. And then at this point, he decides to go look at those bottles in the foreground. At this point, he decides to go to the south of France, the far south of France. And it's a totally different world. Um, it's brighter. There's wide open spaces. There's a lot of nature and, of course, the sun. And he kind of fall, seems to fall in love with the sun there. And I can understand that someone coming from the Netherlands, it's this sort of feels like the inside of a bathroom. It's it's dull, it's gray, and then you see all of this color. And, and this is a time he wants to indulge in the, the whole color narrative. And so that is exactly what he does. And so you can see the sunflowers in the back there. He starts painting sunflowers. He starts falling in love with yellow. And um, he starts to away from all. I'm going to stop the video there. And then I just, just want to show you some other photos I've taken. So here is um, here's one. Shall I do that? Do you recognize, with, do you recognize that, that image? Um, this is sort of just miscellaneous photos from all. You can see it's a very old... It's a very old, um, very old city, it's over a thousand years old. And the, it has castles and the sort of beautiful um, setup of, you know, old, old stones and then flowers and gardens growing around it, which is what makes France always so stunning. Also as a Roman amphitheater, this is the view from the top of it. Overall, uh, here's another view of the stonework on this amphitheater. Um, and then another view as well over there. And then this is a view through sort of an alleyway uh, approaching this um, amphitheater. So now you're outside the amphitheater, and this is just a view towards it. And I, I obviously try to emphasize this this um, the the lines of this lamp uh, it's a modern lamp it's it uses electricity but it it looks like it's very old and something that I quite appreciated from the from the French is that that sort of attention to detail take you through a couple of other images this is that same sort of scene at night you can see it's electric electrified and uh, what else can I show you? This is the bridge from a little bit of a distance away uh, from the river. And uh, you can see it was quite a beautiful spring day. Not that far away is a train, uh, like an old train track. Um, and what else have I got? Yeah, just little, little um, things that I noticed these flowers growing out the side of a, you know, the uh, crack or whatever in a, in a stone wall below a bridge. This is um, right in front of where Van Gogh lived in Arles. So if you go to Arles sort of right now, then you, you will not find the Yellow House. The Yellow House used to be sort of in this area. And then it got bombed. It was, it was bombed in the Second World War. And so uh, you don't really have anything left. I um, I, I don't really know why they, they didn't try and rebuild the yellow house, like put some effort into it. But anyway, this is this is what you see here. And the reason why I took this photo to block out the background is because the background isn't actually the yellow house. So 
this is just where the yellow house is. You can see traffic and there's a patisserie and uh, and so on. Um, but yeah, this is this is the location of where he lived when he was in all. And he's not quite um, he's not quite there yet. He's, he's still got to choose where he wants to live and and um, furnish it and all that sort of thing. Angela says, I work with my patients. Okay. Um, Deb, uh, thanks for joining us. I guess we'll see you a little bit later. Okay. So, Shami also says goodbye. Bye, Deb. Okay. So, I'm now going to revert to the letters. And uh, we, we're going to see how far we get. Um how have you voted? I see um, a couple of you voted. Um, why was Paul Gorga interested in a relationship with the Van Goghs? That's Vincent and Theo. It's important to bear that in mind. He wasn't just friends with Vincent. And I see most of you say he was in it for the money. 7% uh, say he was a nice guy. That's not, not an awful lot of you. Uh, but I've got an idea you're right. And then... Um, 27% or third say, you know what, he recognized Van Gogh's talent. Well, we're going to see, we're going to examine to what extent all of that or any of that is true, right? Okay, so I want to get to the first letter. So was he a nice guy? Was he grubbing for money? Uh, was he using the Van Goghs for money? Did he recognize Van Gogh's talent? We're going to basically find the answers to that in, in these letters. Are you guys ready to get going? So bring it up. So this is the last letter we dealt with from the 21st of February, 1888. And I'm not going to obviously read it again, but just to remind you that he arrives and it's, it's sort of the very last, sort of it's the very end of winter there and he says there's at least 60 centimeters of fallen snow everywhere and it's still falling and then he talks about how beautiful it is he noticed magnificent landscapes talks about the rocks and the trees he says uh the country appears flat while just outside of all um you know a couple of kilometers outside there is quite a lot of relief that's for sure I cycled over it, so I'll still show you photos of that. Um, maybe I've got one here. Um, maybe I can show you show you just a quick photo of me of my mountain bike, the mountain bike I used while I was in all. Um, let's see if I can quickly find it. I don't see it, don't quite see it yet. It's, it's, it's a photo that's not showing itself. So, um, yeah, so it's going to be a bit difficult to find. Anyway, this is a, an image just showing where, where I was actually staying. Um, I was actually staying in this sort of area. Um, I suppose I must make it a bit bigger. You know, staying kind of in this space here. And then you had the pont, I think over here, you had the Pont de Van Gogh. It's like a canal over there. And yeah, I definitely wasn't staying in the, I was staying in very cheap accommodation. And I'm sure Van Gogh was as well to begin with. Anyway, I will show you those mountain bike photos um, in due course. We're not quite there yet in our story. That mountain bike thing I did was I literally cycled from Al to saint Rami, which is where the asylum was. It's quite an epic and pretty damn exhausting cycle. Okay, so let's get going with the letters. Okay. interesting that he um, 
he receives a letter from Paul Gorga as early as the end of February, right? And we're going to deal with that in a second. Let's just see who's here. Um, yeah, did you notice red poppies? Thanks a lot, Yvonne. Uh, okay, so let's uh, do it like this. Just going to have a sip of water. Okay. Dear Vincent, I wanted to write to your brother, meaning to Theo. It's quite a way to, to start the letter. Dear Vincent, I actually wanted to write to somebody else. But I know, so it's like, do you think he's a nice guy? But I know um, that, I think that's a typo, that you see him every day. And I'm afraid of boring him, occupied as he is from morning to night by business. So the only reason he's writing to Vincent is because he thinks Vincent can talk to his brother. Now, why do you think Paul Gorga is so interested in talking to Vincent's brother? Why do, you, why do you think that is? Well, you know, he's an art dealer, right? The other thing is, it seems like he's not aware that Vincent isn't even... I must say, when he says... when he says that you see him every day, I'm not quite sure what that's about. I, I wonder whether it's not a letter that was sent to Paris that Theo then forwarded to Vincent, because otherwise, how is this possible? Unless they've got the date wrong. I'm not quite sure exactly how that worked, because, of course, now he can't see him every day because now he's in uh, all. Anyway, he says, I left to work in Brittany, and I had good good hopes to have funds for that. So already in the second paragraph is complaining about money, right? The little that I sold served to pay for the few pressing debts, and in one month I'm going to be without nothing. So uh, yeah, you have another artist complaining about money. Uh, it talks about money over there. It talks about money over there. It talks about uh, going without anything. But the difference between Paul Gauga is he is at least selling his art. Here he says, the little that I sold paid for a few debts. So Van Gogh isn't selling literally anything. So Gauguin, Paul Gauguin is um, doing um, better than, than Vincent Van Gogh is at this point. He says, by the way, today Paul Gauguin's work is also worth tens of millions. It's also very valuable art. Then he says, I don't want to press your brother. So it seems like this entire letter is about Theo, your brother, your brother. And then I think, is there another one? Uh, anyway, so he says, I don't want to press your brother. I don't want to pester him. I don't want to you know, bother him. But a little word from you on this topic would calm me. So I'm not sure if he means it would help me if you spoke to your brother or if, if he means it would be good if you could tell me what your brother's thinking or doing. But he's basically seems like he wants some reassurance. What, what do you think he wants to know? I think I would imagine that he wants to know um, is my art selling? Uh, is there any interest in it? Has any of it been sold? What is happening? Can you send me some money kind of thing? So he says, um, and this is why I used this title, my God, these questions of money are terrifying for an artist. Now, the alternate um, poll that I wanted to put up for today was, um, who do you think said these words? Do you think Van Gogh said these words? And, and do, you, do you think that is how Van Gogh feels about money? Let me say that again. So it's, my God, these questions of money are terrifying for an artist, right? Now, what I want you to think about is how, what, what Paul Gauguin's situation is. He's selling his art. He's got some debt, but he's sort of paying them off. And he's saying that he's finding the struggle with money terrifying right and now look at vincent van gogh's situation 
he isn't selling his art and he seems to be in that space of not selling his art for, for a really, really long time. And so would you say that Van Gogh is terrified by not having money? Because the reality is he just keeps getting money from Theo. So do you, do you think Van Gogh is terrified not having money? What do you guys think? That's that's right. He is a businessman. That's that's basically summing it up. And so the point I'm trying to make is that that um, Vincent is actually inured, is kind of immune, you know, in a sense, is sort of used to this idea of poverty. See, when I don't wear a hat, there's no clear line over the top of my head. Do you notice that? It kind of blurs. Uh, that's what I don't really like when I do it this way. I don't really want to wear this hat. Um, I don't really want to wear this hat. Timmy, I'm going to put you down. Uh, just give me a second. I'll be with you guys in a moment. Okay, so not sure if that's a lot better, but anyway. Um, so, yeah, the point is just is to say that he's uh, quite a resilient guy. He's quite mentally tough. He um, is used to struggling. And so, again, one of the, one of the theories why Vincent supposedly took his life was that he was suddenly overcome with a concern over money. He'd been, he'd been in a situation of being financially dependent for years. So why would that suddenly bother him in the summer of um, 1890? Right? Can can you see how the art dudes are totally on the wrong track? The the art experts. And. Uh, the other side of it is so you know it's not to say that he that it didn't bother him it's not to say that he did whatever he liked and and um life was a peach kind of thing right he um it was a, a bit of a blight on his existence it was something that was a burden it did drag him down and then the question is how much did it drag him down did it drag him into depression did it drag him into despair or was it something that he as someone so eloquently put here, stoically accepted, right? Ivan says he wasn't terrified, just aggravated. Yeah, that's true. He knows it only too well. I agree with that. Thanks, Kathy. So it's quite interesting seeing Vincent through by juxtaposing him with another artist. We could even say it seeing him intertextually to Paul Gauguin, right? You get a better idea of who he is, um, comparing him to someone who's very different to him. And Paul Gauguin is very different to him. Um, Paul Gauguin knows that. Vincent van Gogh knows that. And the art also shows that. OK, let's continue. Then the next paragraph is also about money. He says, and if it is necessary to give some discounts, and I think what he means by that is if Theo is trying to sell his art, Paul Gauguin's art, um, you know, if you need to give a little discount in order to sell the, the painting, then do that. So, I mean, this entire letter is about Theo and money. I'm writing to your brother. Um, I'm looking for 
for for funds. Uh, I'm trying to pay things. I'm looking for your brother. Um, questions of money, uh, discounts. Don't worry. Uh, as long as I can find some funds, and then you have also another kind of analogy to Van Gogh, where he says, "I've just been sick in bed for 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 two weeks, over two weeks." It says, I just spent 15 days in bed with a fever and I'm starting to work again. Have you heard that before? And then the same thing kind of comes up is, does Paul Gorgar have syphilis at this point? Because we know for a fact that he had it and I think died of it. And we know for a fact that Vincent van Gogh had it. So this fever that he has, do you think that's, that's syphilis at this point? Anyway, and then he says, I'm starting to work again. He says, if I can just last five to six months, I believe I will do some good canvases. And um, at the end of five to six months, Paul Gogol is actually going to join Vincent van Gogh in all. And that's, that's really going to be an exciting climax to this year, 1888. It, it is a, it's, it's one of the monumental years in the Van Gogh story out of three. I would say the three monumental years are this year, 1889, which is when he's in the asylum, which is when he paints Starry Night, and then 1890, which is the last year of his life, the last summer, when he, his output really shoots up and he does some incredible landscapes, including Wheatfield with Crows and, and, and the portrait of Dr. Gachet. Um, anyway, then he says, an encouraging word in answer, if it is possible. And so that's one of the early, um, early, uh, what's the word, not clues, but early signs, early symptoms that Paul Gorgar is going to be part of the story. And in the same way, when I told the, narrated the um, story of, well, you guys haven't heard it yet. Um, I've scripted the story of Magellan entering the ocean down in South America, um, you know, he sort of enters it and he calls it the Pacifico because it seems very really a calm sea compared to the other side. And um, the end of that, what seems like a fairy tale is that Magellan actually dies because he's, he, he comes into this experience totally naive, totally thinking that the Spice Islands are just a few days ago. All they had to do was get through the bottom of South America, and they would see the Spice Islands literally on the other side, like a few days away. And it ended up being almost four months that they just sailed to get there. Now, in the same way, the end of this this journey to all starts off with Paul Gogar asking Vincent about his brother and for money, but it ends with a bloodbath, um, Vincent losing his ear, and Paul Gogar at that time. Paul Gugar abandons Vincent. Vincent's like lying in a bed covered in blood. And the people actually think he's dead because he's just lying there not moving. And that is when Paul Gugar leaves all and, and returns to Paris. And guess what? Part of the reason is that he's told, oh, my art is sold. whoop but he do I'm out of here, right? So again, if you, if you consider the poll, um, why was Paul Gogar interested in a relationship? He was in it for the money. He was a nice guy. Now it's down to 5% say he was a nice guy. And he recognized Van Gogh's talent. That's up to 32%. So we're going to find out whether he did recognize um, Van Gogh's talent. Okay, so let's go to the next letter. Um, Karen Sanderson, hi from Wisconsin, good to see you here. Uh, Sharon, I'll, I will be continuing the story of Magellan. Yeah, that's true, that's Magellan, yeah. Funnily enough, Paul Gogar actually also went to live the end of his days on a tropical island, I think it was, I think it was Tahiti, so yeah. There's also talk at a certain point where Van Gogh thought he might go and live in Madagascar, which is right next to South Africa. Yeah, it is, um, it is actually quite shocking. It's quite shocking. 
Um, okay, so let's have a look at some of these paintings. These are some of the first paintings um, that we see having arrived in Ireland. And the first one's of an old lady. And I think that's quite a good picture. Uh, compared to what we've seen, that is not bad. And it is quite interesting that he arrives in all and um, he can't really find a pretty, uh, you know, a pretty young girl or girlfriend. Um, and so he paints this, this old lady, kind of looks like a granny, doesn't look terribly happy either. And then I think you may remember this, uh, but this is the snow that he sees around him and there's all in the background. Somewhere in all of that is the Colosseum, the Colosseum that I showed you somewhere in there. And I must say as dreary as this picture is, it's still a lot brighter than the potato eaters as you know, the scene probably was quite dreary to begin with sort of uh, white and gray, but this is, this is still a more colorful and, and, and varied uh, picture in terms of color than, for example, the potato eaters and the um, excrement colored potatoes in a basket where everything is brown, right? So that color is starting to shine through. And then, of course, this is extremely colorful. Um, someone, I asked you guys to suggest a picture for the background of this episode, and someone suggested the pork butcher shop. Is that someone here, by the way? And so you can see just how colorful that is. I don't, uh, can't say I really like this that much. It seems a little too garish for my taste, but it does have a quite a lot of orange, which is the, um, the sort of symbolic color for this channel. And so I thought that was quite quite worth it in that sense. He seems to be painting um, a, a, a youngish French lady doing window shopping. That seems to be what he's doing. Um, Mel, you would know that as someone who's got, uh, who's Portuguese. Okay, so let's uh, go. Is there, are there any other pictures? Okay, so this is the 25th of February. We'll see whether Vincent mentions Paul Gorgar or his letter to him. And you know, he's supposed to be saying to, to Theo something about, can you tell Paul how his money situation is or what you expect or whatever? Let's see how he handles that. So 25th of February, my dear Theo, thanks for your nice letter, also the 50 franc note. So far, I haven't found life as cheap as I'd hoped, but still I have these three studies done, which probably I would not have been able to do in Paris these days. And I've got to say the, um, the impression I get is that they're building the Eiffel Tower and I, I, I don't know, I just kind of get the idea that Vincent felt like Paris is sort of under construction. I kind of need to get away from all the banging, right? Uh, I just want to um, confirm that when the construction of the Eiffel Tower actually took place. So it began in January 1887. So by the time Van Gogh, and it was completed on the 31st of March, 1889. So basically in the year that Van Gogh was in all, what was the sort of main year that the Eiffel Tower kind of went up. All right, yes, some, um, some images of that. Um, okay, except all. Sorry, the tab that I need to get back onto StreamYard is behind like a lamp. So that's why I sort of need to do that. But there you can see uh, uh, the Eiffel Tower under construction. Uh, you can see the first digging started in 
like a year before Van Gogh went to all in uh, on the 26th of January 1887 but you can imagine that there was a lot of um of hammering and and, and um anyway the sounds of construction uh in Paris and for a country bumpkin that's used to the countryside and maybe used to the occasional train coming here and the the the, the sounds of clanking and bear in mind it's, it's it's hammering rivets or whatever into metal it's hammering metal into metal and all of that you know you can imagine it's a cacophony of of clanging right and uh, you just wonder whether this to some extent um sort of irritating the artist or or maybe it didn't but i mean he, he never painted as far as i know van gogh never painted the eiffel tower so i don't i don't know if i if I believe that he liked the idea. So these are, um, I'm just trying to see, yeah, there you have some more images of, of it under construction. Can you imagine it would have been an incredible job, but what an amazing thing that this tower went up in Van Gogh's time. And right, in, so you might say, Wow, Van Gogh is so long ago, um, you know, it's old news. Well, so is the Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower is contemporaneous to Van Gogh's story. And look how it has stood the test of time. Van Gogh as well, uh, incidentally. So there's just some interesting um, design elements here on this website. Um, And there was a lot of controversy at the time that the Eiffel Tower came out. Um, it was a, a very modern thing and not everyone appreciated it. Um, there was a protest against it, um, including a protest signed by big names in the world of literature. Uh, Guy de Maupassant, these are some of the people that Van Gogh himself was reading. So you can imagine that he didn't like it either. Um, but that's one of the authors that he was reading. Um, and then um and then there was other insulting commentary calling the eiffel tower a tragic street lamp and this belfry skeleton and the mast of iron gymnasium app apparatus someone else called it a high and skinny pyramid of iron ladders um, someone else called it a half-built factory pipe a carcass waiting to be fleshed out with whatever. And so you can see there's just a lot of um, lot of discussion uh, around the Eiffel Tower at the time that Van Gogh left Paris. You kind of get the idea that he, he sort of had enough of um, that sort of progressive aspect to Paris. Paris in the beginning was charming and, and um, a nice place to be and towards the end it was this rattling um, noisy place full of full of chaos and disharmony right okay so let's go back to the letter um, over there okay so um he goes on to say, so life's not very cheap. He says, I'm glad the news from Holland was pretty satisfactory. As for Raid, or is that Reed? I'm not very surprised, though he is wrong, that he has taken it badly that I got to the midi before him. It would be rather unfair for us to say on our part that we would never have taken advantage of his acquaintance since number one, he has made us the present of a very beautiful painting, the painting which pathetically we meant to get hold of. Number two, Reed has made the price of the Monticellos go up. And since we own five of them, it follows that these have gone up in value. And then number three, he was good and pleasant company for the first three months. So you can see there's a, been a bit of a shift here. You kind of get the sense that Van Gogh is also more actively part of the painting business that Theo's trying to um, 
trying to evolve, trying to grow, trying to build than he was before he arrived in Paris. It seems a bit more like there's a sense of a partnership going on, although Van Gogh seems to be not contributing terribly much to that. Anyway, he says, for our part, we wanted to make a far more important business arrangement with him than the Monticelli's. So you see these words coming up, business, business arrangement. Then he says, if we, it seems uh, that if we are to maintain the, the right to be masters on our own territory where the impressionists are concerned, so that there can be no doubt as to our good faith towards Reed, we might let him do as he likes without infer interference from us with the Monticelli's of Marseilles, insisting that our interest in the dead painters is only indirectly financial. So it seems like the art crowd are trying to decide whether they like the Van Goghs or not, but specifically whether they approve of Theo's attitude to, to them and to art. Uh, what does Theo think of the Impressionists? What does Vincent think of the Impressionists? What do the Impressionists think of them? And that's quite an important question to ask in that time. It's the same question that, that that's sort of coming up right now in true crime. What do I think of um, fake news and ghouls in the true crime thing? And what does fake news and true and, and the ghouls think of me? And and what does what do the you know, authoritative and respected people think of them and me, and etc. It's quite an important thing to figure out. And then also, what do you guys think in general? Like, what do you guys think you want? Do you want the fake news? Do you want the ghouls? Is it something that needs to be controlled? In other words, it's a discussion that is, um, uh, you know, highly related and highly relevant to to. Uh, the to that sort of zeitgeist. Well, this is the art zeitgeist that they've got to figure out, right? Where do you fit into it? How do you um, become respected and credible and also hold on to what you think and know? Um, you know, it's that whole conversation. Anyway, it goes on to say... Um, if you agree in this, you can, if necessary, tell him from me too that if he intends to come to Marseille to buy Monticelli's, he has nothing to fear from us, but that we have the right to ask what he intends to do, seeing that we have got the start on him on this territory. So can you see uh, he's referring to the Impressionists quite a few times, and, and what this obviously shows is that he has been affected by the Impressionists. It's almost like you have the period before Van Gogh arrives in in Paris. It's almost like you can say it's a post, sorry, a pre-impressionist phase. Then you have him in Paris where he suddenly wakes up like, wow, impressionism is real. Color is a thing. People want color. Wow, I think I actually care about, I, I see what is going on here. I actually care about color as well. And then the sort of post-Paris Impressionism, which ultimately becomes his unique style, which is expressionistic. Uh, yeah, he is becoming a bit more business oriented. That's right. He, he was influenced in terms of color. That's exactly that's exactly what he needed. He needed to come out of the color doldrums, right? It is, it, look, look at the Eiffel Tower, it starts, it, it arises out of ignominy and controversy and criticism. And ultimately, it's, it's one of the most known, loved, recognizable structures in the world. Uh, when you go to Paris, as I've done quite a few times, you, you go to the Eiffel Tower. It's part of knowing where you are, uh, knowing that you're in Paris, telling people, that you in Paris as well. Okay, so he goes on to say, you are certainly helping our friend Koenig, uh, Koenig, or the correct pronunciation is probably Koenig, it probably is Koenig, mm. 
By letting him stay with you, uh, his visit to Rive must have proved to him that um, Koenig um, in, uh, in Afrikaans means king. So it sounds like that's his surname. It's a name that sounds like king. Uh, anyway, he says, if you take him in, I think that it would be a way out of difficulty for him. Only he must explain everything to his father so that so that um, you will not have any indirect responsibilities. Now, I don't know about you. I'm this at this point in the letter, and I'm thinking, when are we going to hear about Paul Goga? Isn't Vincent supposed to convey a message? And so he says, if you see Bernard, tell him that so far I've had to pay more than at Pont Arvin, but that I think if one got a private lodging here, one could economize. So th the idea I get is that Van Gogh has arrived in all, booked himself into a cheap hotel, like I did, or I did that because he did that, um, and but he's looking for somewhere that's even cheaper that would be amount to a private lodging. And that ultimately is the yellow house. Then he says, well, that's what I'm trying to find, a private lodging. And as soon as I've verified it, I'll write to him what I think the average expenses come to. So can you see there's quite a lot of talk here about money, uh, how much things cost, how much, how one can do business. Um, you know, that's kind of what they're preoccupied with. Still no mention of, Paul Gogar, quite interesting. He says, it seems to me at times that my blood is more or less actually beginning to think of circulating, which was not the case during the last days in Paris. Honestly, I could not have stood it much longer. Again, you've kind of got to ask, what did he not like about Paris? And as I say, maybe the, the, the clanking, the, you know, the, because I don't know if there are too many things as unpleasant as being right beside a construction site and not actually being part of that process. Um, it's it's kind of an endurance contest. I've actually had someone demolish a wall right next to where I am, and and I guess they're trying to rebuild it now. Um, so I've been hearing the sound of bricks being, uh, you know, hammered out one by one. Uh, it's definitely quite annoying. It's, a, it's also annoying when you work through the night, as I have for not not uh, so much tonight, but but the last couple of days in the past couple of weeks. And then you need to sleep to some extent part of the day, and then there's construction going on. It's not terribly fun. Uh, anyway, he says, I have to get my paints and canvases either at a grocer's or at a bookseller's, and they haven't got everything I need. I shall have to go to Marseille to see what the state of the sort of thing is there. I had hoped to find some good blue, and I think I may, since one must be able to buy the raw material at first hand in Marseille. And I wish I could make blues like Zyam. They don't fade so much as the others. One day we shall see. Don't worry and give a handshake to the comrades from me. Uh, ever yours, Vincent. Well, is there still no mention of Paul Gogar? Anyway, here he says in the postscript, the studies I've done are an old Olesian woman, so it's an Olesian is someone from all, a local, a landscape with snow, a view of a bit of pavement with a, a pork butcher shop um, in the background. The women are quite beautiful here. That is no lie. But on the other hand, the museum in all is atrocious and a joke and ought to be in Tarason. There's also a museum of genuine antiques here. Now, um, if I can share my experience briefly, when I went to all, uh, it was actually quite strange. I mean, I when I when I flew from South Africa to Europe, I, I entered through Amsterdam. I then spent a little bit of time in in the canals of Amsterdam um, before catching a flight to Portugal. Then I was spent a little bit of time in Portugal. I, I wouldn't really say I spoke to too, too many people when I was in Portugal. Uh, I did speak to people, but but there weren't really any moments that stood out. There was a moment outside the ex ocean a, a bunch of people, like a family, were sort of running around, and they ended up being South African. So it was so weird. Um, 
the one sort of main conversation I did have was with sort of fellow South Africans. Um, they was, I think, living in Switzerland or they were traveling in a Swiss camper van. I can't quite remember. Um, but anyway, the point is when I went to all, when I, so when I caught the train from Portugal through Spain into France, and then I think the penultimate stop was Nîmes. Um, I was waiting at the station at Nîmes to catch my train and actually missed the train I needed to catch, which meant that I missed the people that I was staying with who were going to take me to my accommodation. But anyway, while I was waiting in Nimes to, to catch the, the next train, um, and I kind of had my suitcase in front of me and I had this hat, this hat on, on that suitcase. Um, yeah, I, I happened to be sitting next to a, a, a pretty brunette and she, I don't know, at some point she just started talking to me and, um, and uh, it was quite weird. We, we started talking before the train arrived. And then we ended up talking, sitting with one another on the train. We spoke the whole way nonstop to all. And then when I arrived, when we arrived in all, she said, uh, I said, look, um, can you recommend which taxi I should take? Because they were like all Mercedes Benzes. And I was like, I don't know if I want to, isn't there like a, a um, economy class taxi in this town. And she said, uh, well, don't worry, I'll, I'll, um, I'll walk you to where you want to go. I actually know where it is. I'll, I'll show you a shortcut. And so um, she also kind of chaperoned me through this incredible ancient city. So you, you don't know what to expect when you arrive at the station. And suddenly you're in this place that is so magical uh, it, it's it's extremely old and you're just in this totally different world and 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 she was sort of not quite le leading me by the hand but basically uh taking me uh through this beautiful place and she told me that she'd actually worked as a tourist guide there for a season or whatever and uh, it was just a very nice way of being shown a place and um and then obviously we got to the end of our little um, jaunt through there. And then she was going one way and she said, you need to go that way. And um, and then I, I think I got her Instagram and we actually still follow one another on Instagram. I actually think she's recently gone to South Korea. And the other thing that was quite interesting about it was she was a French police woman. So um but i remember thinking to myself as well um that she was really quite beautiful right and um, that is also vincent's early um experience that wow the the woman here in the south of france are actually quite beautiful he says that's no lie and so yeah i don't i mean i didn't go to all thinking I'm Vincent van Gogh and I'm not going to have all the experiences he's going to have. But, but that was a very um, strangely magical and unexpected introduction to all. And I don't think I, I had any experience like that in the rest of Europe where, where someone, I didn't talk to someone, they spoke to me and then, and then undertook to uh show me something um and it was just really in, in, like after after that i kind of thought to myself i'm really glad i missed that first train otherwise i wouldn't have had this um kind of delightful experience you know i felt like i'm, I'm really glad, glad that i missed the train that i was supposed to catch okay so And, and that reminds me of what um, Boris Becker said. I think I also said it on this channel where he was being interviewed by the Financial Times about going bankrupt. And, 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 and the reporter asked him about regrets and jail and, and everything. And he said, you know what? I'm thinking about the next opportunity. And the hardest thing for a tennis player is to leave behind the double fault 
and the missed opportunity. And he's so caught up in the regret of that and the memory of that, that he misses the next opportunity. And, and so it compounds that thing. And so the, in the same way, if I was really, I tend to be someone, if I make a mistake like missing a train, I'll be pretty overly uh, pissed off about it. And fortunately, I wasn't dwelling that much on it when, uh, you know, I had this, this uh, alternative experience. Uh, Deborah, uh, good to see you here. Okay, let's uh, keep going. My dear Theo, will you read the letter I've written to Mr. Tierstig? That's a Dutch art dealer, I think. And I will, and and he kind of didn't get along very well with him uh, when when they were in the same space. Uh, he says, "Will you send it to him with a letter of your own if you think it is a good move?" You see my idea. So can you see that they are acting now strategically? That they're trying to figure out um, business strategies and business ideas and making moves right in the art world. You see, my idea was that we must try something in this direction because we shall have a hold over Reed through uh, Van Visseling and over Van Visseling through Tierstig. Uh, and this you will explain to Tierstig yourself. Since I am dependent on you and you yourself get your own income from the Borsod Valadon people, I do not want to do anything against that firm. On the contrary, I ask nothing better than that the business you began in the shop on the boulevard should go on and increase in importance. So can you see what is going on? At the time that he goes to all, he's be, he himself is very business-minded. He's becoming quite entrepreneurial. And, and that's something that's quite unusual to us if you've known Van Gogh as long as we've known him. Uh, he hasn't been this entrepreneurial until now. But now he is. Now he's trying to make a success and you know is really starting that process with two years left to live he's starting to think strategically about his work and his efforts and he's just got two years left to live and it does make you wonder if he'd lived another five years what could he have produced so what i'm trying to say is in just two years following when he when that switch clicks in his mind where he says i'm going to work smarter look at what happens his, his entire life changes the history of art changes forever as well okay so he goes on to say you need the support of other employees of the firm if tierstig refuses to have anything to do with it we still have reed and visselin so he's kind of talking here about their um Kind of assets you know the people in the art world that are on their side that that have their backs and that they have their backs it's kind of uh, who is in um you know which boat are you in kind of thing you know then he says and, and it's also referring to english agents dutch agents working with english agents then he says you know that van Wisseling married a daughter of a picture dealer in glasgow a business rival of Reed. So this is what it really is all about. Who are our rivals? Who are our competitors? Who are uh, our, um, who do we need to watch? Who do we need to try and um, figuratively get in bed with in a business sense? Um, you know, and it's, the whole thing is navigating their way through the art world in terms of collaborating and creating um arrangements and so on and so you may have you may have um encountered van gogh a few years ago and you may have said it's not a competition i'm just trying to paint it's not a competition you kind of get the sense here that it is starting to appreciate that it is com competitive and that it is a competition and he's trying not to um he's trying to gain ground uh, he's trying not to lose in terms of that then he again he talks about the impressionist you can see just what a big impression they've made on him think about that word impression and impressionists impressionistic art is like a 
an idea of something. It's almost like you take a scene in front of it and you put the opaque glass that, that, that is used in bathroom windows or shower windows and you put that over a scene. That is often what impressionist art is. It, it makes it feel softer and, um, you know, there's an opaque sense to that art. Um, it talks about doing this in opposition to us. So again, if your competitors are doing things that, um, you know, how's that going to affect you? Um, he says, if Visseling ever takes it up, and above all, if now or later you have a chat with Visseling about it, then Tierstick, then Tierstick could at once reproach you. Again, a reference to impressionists. Why? Did you keep the firm that employs you in the dark? So all of this kind of intrigue going on. Uh, he goes on to say, so you must speak to Tierstig about it at once and save you the trouble of writing a long letter. He talks about Reed and the Impressionist, von Wisseling and the affair, you know, this affair is obviously a business affair. So can you see, this is the, it's not really so important to pay attention to the details as to know that this is the spirit that the Van Goghs are operating under. Business deals, art, um, movements in the art world, uh, movers and shakers in the art world, right? Then he says, Tierstick could easily dispose of 50 or so for us in Holland, and so on and so on. Um, finally, what I propose in the letter should not be very disagreeable either. Um, he says, if you think my letter ill-timed, you have my full permission to burn it. Um, he talks about piloting him around the studios and he will see for himself that next year people will start talking and will go on talking about the new school long enough. So that, that's also kind of a reference to publicity and public relations and marketing and getting people talking about what they are doing. So I don't see any reference to Paul Gogar, do you? There's, there's no nothing about it. And you almost get the sense that was Vincent insulted by that letter? Did he feel like, wow, you wrote a letter to me only just to say, can you talk to your brother? Can you ask your brother for money? You kind of get the sense that Van Gogh didn't really appreciate that letter. Otherwise, he would be talking about it. Um, then he says, you know very well that Tierstig is as much at home in the English business as a fish out of water. And then he talks about business in London or Paris and so on. And then he says, the association of the artists will come about all the more easily since Tierstig will have no obligations to our having the artist's interest at heart. So you kind of have a thing, you know, we've just had the Oscars. You kind of have a thing here where... It feels like they're starting to to think about forming um, like academies and studios and 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 groups where artists can come together and 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 help one another and um, you know like like art like actors guilds things like that. It's a way to for artists to uh, to. Um, improve themselves, educate themselves, but it's also a way, an easier way for them to be found. They're less obscure. So in the same way where you would uh, go to an agent, if you're trying to source a model, you can also go to um, one of these studios and, and find the artist that's going to suit you. So that's, that's, that's how they seem to be trying to organize themselves. Bear in mind, Virginia Woolf uh, did the same thing like, 60 years later, um, she she formed, um, she, she became part of a, a group of, of writers, right? And then I think you can ask the question, does Van Gogh succeed? Does, does he succeed in institutionalizing himself, in creating some kind of studio that he's just part of, or does he end up, despite these high ideas and big, big, big ideas, does he end up remaining kind of an individual? Does he end up almost um, not being able to organize a sort of social network, I guess? 
Uh, Helena says, I like your little sunflower there, says Paul would be a direct competition to Vincent. Not really, the, the art is quite different. Um, to give you a simple idea, Paul's art is, um, is sort of cerebral, it, it's imagined. So he's not painting what's in front of him. And uh, he doesn't really tend to paint landscapes. He tends to paint um, religious and sort of sensual and sort of exotic scenes. I'm not saying he never paints a landscape, but his art is in a far more on a cerebral plane. Uh, it's a totally different kind of kind of art. Um, the other thing about his art is it looks smooth and um, almost cartoonish in a way, but but in a in a in a good way. Whereas Vincent's art is extremely rough and um, and it's just very very different art. So let me show you a quick. Uh, example of Paul Gogard's art. Now, as I said, there's something cartoonish about it, but that doesn't mean it's simple or unsophisticated. Uh, what's a good example? Well, th this painting is called where do we come from? Can you see it's it's very different, very, very different art. And that is not Paul Gogo, that is a different artist. But you kind of get an idea of the style that he that he has. And you can see he's very interested in um, uh, non-Europeans, I guess. He's, he's interested in, um, well, these are Tahitians at the end of the day. He's interested in an exotic experience of, of, um, of the world, I guess. So, you know, in a weird way, what was happening in Paris was Paris was becoming very civilized. And you kind of had this counterculture where people wanted to go not just back to the farm, which Van Gogh seemed to be wanting to do before he went to Paris, but wanting to go back to being totally primitive, like living in a grass hut and um, having five wives, which is what Paul Gauguin sort of was moving towards and a uh, woman walking around you topless all day you know as as maybe they were uh, want to do in the in in tahiti so he kind of wants this um I'm trying to think of the word that means um not quite sure why I'm, my brain is like not firing very well uh what does it mean when you just want um to be excited and enjoy yourself all the time. Um, what was that? What's the word for that? Um, a hed hedonist. He's a uh, Paul Gauguin is a total hedonist. And 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 so what is that? What kind of influence does a hedonist have on Vincent Van Gogh? Bear in mind that Van Gogh is already someone who's drinking quite a lot, someone who has an appetite for women. Um, and is a passionate fellow, and now he comes across a hedonist. What do you think? What kind of impact do you think that's going to have on his life? Well, the 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 end of that, whether you whatever you think happened, the end of that is that he loses his ear. So the the hedonist phase ends in a missing ear. So you can imagine just how hedonistic this phase was, and that's where we're heading uh, as we go from letter to letter. So literally he loses his ear by December around Christmas time. And so Vincent has his ear now for the next nine months or so. 
quite an interesting way to think about it. Yeah, his wives were like 14 years old. So Paul Gogo is definitely not a a good guy. Uh, you know, if you think about Vincent's father, who Vincent's father might disapprove of the most for for a man to be hanging around his his son. Um, or for his son to be friends with, it would probably be someone like Paul Gogar. But the other side of it is Vincent wants to experience life. Vincent wants, Vincent's like been living in like a toilet, essentially. He's been living in this dark, smelly, dingy corner of the world, and he wants to come alive. And so he's in a way using Paul Gogar to experience another dimension to life. You know, it's like, haven't you ever been in that situation? You, you've got a friend who is a bad influence, but you kind of feel like I, I need a bad influence at this stage of my life. I need that <laughs> that kind of influence. I need to I need to get out more and, and for better or worse, that's how it's going to happen. OK, so he goes on to say. Um, in my opinion, the whole crux of the matter in England is this. Either the artists give their work away at a wretched price, or they combine and choose for themselves intelligent agents who won't fleece them. So can you see this entire letter is really about art business, and it's not terribly inspiring, but it is winter, and as spring springs, Vincent's going to become more uh, inspiring. He's going to be inspired and he's going to pass that on through his letters. So here's a rare letter, not a very long one, to Wilhelmina, 28th of February, 1888. Dear sister, I for my part might say just as well that I shall stop writing at the very moment you reply. The simplest thing is not to write if it causes too much trouble and the inclination is not always there. Not the friendliest um, opening I've ever seen in a Van Gogh letter, right? It, it seems to be um, not in a terribly good mood, does he, writing to his sister. Anyway, then he says, it is an excellent thing that you are beginning to acquaint yourself with all the mischief brewed by that villain Voltaire, and you will surely find that in Candida, Voltaire already had the impertinence to laugh at the highly serious life which we ought only to use for and devote to the best ends. And I need not tell you that this crime is something horrible in itself. So can you see he is talking about acquainting yourself with all the mischief. And that is a, a, literally a, what Van Gogh is about to do himself, is, is about to be um, mischievous, is about to drink, is about to go to brothels, is about to well, he's about to lose his ear at the end of all of that mischief. And he's, he's decrying the serious life. And obviously, it would be a very serious life the following year in the asylum. So let's see if we can get a bit of information about, about that. So I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. Is it Candida? It's a French satire written by Voltaire um, during the Age of Enlightenment. It's quite an old book. It's about a century old by the time it was published in 1759. Uh, sorry, by the time Van Gogh read it. It was about a century old. Um, the main message is that all is not for the best, and that is not the best of all possible worlds. Voltaire argues that evil ser serves no T.O theological purpose and that optimism is absurd that's interesting okay so if you want to know a bit more about this book that he's, re he's recommending to his sister um, uh, Candida is the illegitimate nephew of a German baron I'm just reading this on Google he grows up in the baron's castle under the tutelage of the scholar Pangloss, and this this guy teaches him that the world is the this world is the best of all possible worlds. In other words, he's a realist. And then Candida falls in love with the Baron's young daughter. So think about that statement. Um, 
think about that statement this world is the best of all possible worlds right and do you agree with that do you agree that that's true do you agree that you shouldn't be optimistic and think what if this or what if that do you agree that reality is the only thing you can really work with uh, and um, you shouldn't live in in fairy tales and you shouldn't be caught up in the nightmares of the past the only time is now and so uh, this is the best of all possible worlds you've got the world you're alive right now do something with it that's 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 kind of the attitude and it is uh, if you think about criminals right where you say um, a criminal isn't happy with the world that he lives in a criminal wants to cheat to a better world or he wants to escape the accountability of a world that seems to be worse than it otherwise would be but if a criminal could just accept that the world that he lives in i'm talking about before he becomes a criminal is acceptable is the best of all possible worlds and just make do with it try and find your way through it then you wouldn't have crimes you wouldn't have criminals if there wasn't a sense of i'm living in this drudgery i want a fairy tale well then there wouldn't be this attempt to cheat the drudgery and think about the way Vincent van gogh himself is a great figure who embraces the drudgery of his life, who transcends the struggle of his life and makes, turns it into something quite magical and meaningful. And um, as I say, transcendental, it, 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 it transcends time because it's so powerful. Uh, yes, he did paint the chair in 1888. He also painted a chair that represented Paul Gauguin, and, and those are really interesting works of art. Um, paintings by Van Gogh. Okay, let's continue. And that's what I find interesting about Van Gogh's letters. I'm, I'm a writer, I'm also a reader, and it's interesting to read about writing from a different era that you otherwise wouldn't know about. And here you've got Vincent, the book reviewer, telling us about interesting books in 1888 and 1880s and you kind of feel like yeah that is actually quite interesting he, in, in other words the same way you might recommend a netflix movie now a netflix series like i would recommend you watch yellowstone or the white lotus he is recommending these these narratives these stories and, and they are meaningful they are meaningful to him and they are meaningful to that time. And, and that's quite interesting on this side of time, right? Uh, anyway, he says, I cannot write very well about Mauve. I think of him every day, but that's all. It was a great shock to me, but personally as a human being, he may have been quite different from what people said of him once in a while. I've got an idea Mauve may have died. What does this say? Okay. Mauve is his, um, isn't, isn't it his uh, cousin? I'm just trying to think what the connection was again. Anton Mauve was a Dutch realist painter and he had a influence on his cousin-in-law, Vincent van Gogh, so it was quite close. Not his cousin, but his cousin-in-law. Uh, and then, yeah, he did die. He died in the 5th of February, 1888. Not a, so my, my brain seems to be quite fuzzy, but actually it's is operating. Um, so he is talking about him um, post posthumously, right? He says, now it is so hard for me to imagine that those who penetrate to the core of life who for the rest judge themselves as if they were dealing with somebody else and who treat others as unceremoniously as they were taking themselves to task. I find it so hard to imagine that such can cease to exist. Now I know that it is hardly to be supposed that the white potato and salad grubs which later change into cockchafers should be able to form tenable ideas about their supernatural existence in the year after. This is pretty... Um, 
pretty cerebral um, writing and it's pretty out there, you know, um, from white potato salad to um, basically outer space. And that it would be premature of them to enter upon supernatural researchers for enlightenment about this problem, seeing that the gardener or other persons interested in salad and vegetables would crush them underfoot, considering them harmful insects. But for parallel reasons, I have little confidence in the correctness of our human concepts of future life. And you see, it is writing in a very profound way for a, a guy who to everybody else resembles a dirty tramp and a drunk is a is a is a big thinker because he's also a big reader and he's a traveler and he has experienced a lot of the world and he's experienced the world in a way many of us don't is is a intelligent educated person who's experienced the um the poverty of the world in a visceral way and that's not something that many people do he says we are as little able to judge of our own metamorphoses without biases and prematureness as the white salad grubs can of theirs for the very cogent reason that the salad worms ought to eat salad roots in the very interest of their higher development. He's actually writing about worms here. In the same way, I think that a painter ought to paint pictures, possibly something else can come of that. Can you see what a humble approach he has to his own vocation? He sees himself in a way as a worm trying to find its way through the world. Right, and he's not trying to paint for the art crowd. He's trying to paint for you and me. He's trying to. He's not trying to paint. This is what I think a lot of the folks, uh, when I used to have the Van Gogh letters, in the True Crime Rocket Science on that channel. And every time I did a video, I'd lose 20, 50, 100 subscribers. Uh, ultimately, lost hundreds and hundreds of subscribers over the course of say 30, 30 letters. The thing that I think those people who are like, I'm not interested in Van Gogh, don't realize is Van Gogh was interested in them. Van Gogh was interested in you. Van Gogh wasn't interested in the art crowd, the that whole world that is like a different universe, um, that is like a different language, that is this inaccessible place. Van Gogh was interested in, in, in our common humanity. And I think that's why I'm interested in him to such an extent. Because that's such a rare conversation you have um, at the level that he has it. And I do try to have that conversation in true crime as well. I try and bring true crime away from the experts, away from all the flesh, back to our common humanity. What are we learning about ourselves through this story? What are we learning about our society through the story? How can we improve ourselves how can we improve society? And that is regrettably a conversation you so seldom hear anybody having um, when they deal. It seems like true crime is this rat race and I can make lots of money out of it and I can use it and I can trade off it. But what about the, the reality that somebody died and that this is a sign that something's wrong with us and with our society. No, I don't have that conversation. I want to get my pound of flesh as well. Well, how does that make you any less psychopathic than the criminal that you are criticizing and trying to do your life spotting? It means you're just as opportunistic as everybody else. You, you're just another rat. You're just another vulture. You're just another predator. And this is just the way that you predate on society. Instead of trying to um, uh, take advantage of society at its own expense, why not try and actually help create a society? Why not do that? What a thought. What a thought to have. <laughs> Let's try and actually make our society better. No, 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 no. Let's think about how horrible people are in society and and uh, no, 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 let's actually even sensationalize, make it even more horrible that the, that, than they really are. Let's make that our conversation. Let's dwell on just how the horrible monsters that are in society. And now let's go into another. The, hey, guys, he has another horrible monster. You know what? I think he maybe is a serial killer. Maybe he's killed 10 people. Maybe it's 20. Um, uh, what's the motive here? I don't know. I think he's a monster. Let's go. Into, he has another monster. 
And that's what they do over and over. Do you think that's a society you want to be part of? A superficial, empty, hollow society that, that basically um, ingratiates itself at the expense of itself. And you, then you are just one, one, one additional parasite in the society. Um, that's not a society I want to be part of, right? I think we want to be a, a, a meaningful society that cares about itself. And when you go from one criminal to the next that way, like a butterfly, do you really, are you really saying that you care about the society? Do you care about the victims? Do you care about what has happened there? Or, or is what you're really saying, I care about the fact that everybody else cares about this and I, wanna, I want to get something out of that. Because that's extremely shallow and that, that, um, that treadmill takes you nowhere except backwards. It, be, it turns you into a shallow um, devourer of human tragedy. That's not who I want to be. And that's also why I sort of feel like seeing the Van Gogh story ultimately as somebody who commits suicide um, isn't a fair reflection of who he is, but I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised people are that weak in the um, appraisal of a subtle story. And, and that's why I'm trying to address it. I'm trying to make us more sensitive to subtlety. And these, these letters take us there. Do you agree to me? Okay. What does Deborah say? Um, yeah, that's interesting. Vincent painted pink peach trees. I think we see that in the next letter as a gift to Moses Wood. He also painted um, peach blossoms with a blue background when Theo's, either when Theo got engaged or when their, their child was born. I'm not quite sure, one of the two. Yeah, that's exactly what he's saying. And isn't that quite a nice sentiment to say, I don't have to be the biggest deal. I can be a small deal and I can do what I'm doing authentically. And maybe that does mean something. In the scale of things, maybe one authentic worm helps the world uh, be what it is in a, in a way that at least isn't uh, toxic, you know. No, being one, one, one uh, sort of authentic, full-blown, full-bodied worm, and if a bird comes in and devours it, at least it'll be good food for, you know, for some other creature in the world. So anyway, he says, um, I penetrated some greater distances into the south. I've observed two. Uh, too often that neither my work nor my health is in very condition, good condition during the winter. That's also a very uh, sort of prescient message he's giving us is that don't expect me to be healthy in winter. Don't expect me to paint very much in winter. When I paint, I go out into the landscape. I feel the sun on my shoulders. I feel the cold in my back. And so, um, yeah, I'm going to struggle to paint with as much energy in the winter than, than, than I would wanting to go out into the summer. And so again, why on earth would Van Gogh feel depressed in the middle of summer when he was in very good condition, when he was healthy, when he was working? Why would he not um, feel depressed and despair in the middle of winter? It doesn't make sense, it really doesn't make sense. Anyway, he says, what they want in pictures nowadays is a contrast of colors, right? It's not just colors, how they contrast. These colors highly intensified and variegated rather than subdued gray tones. And you kind of want to say, hallelujah, you've finally, you've finally seen the light. Uh, thank, thank goodness for that. Because for how long have you been uh, painting slime and excrement? And so he's realized um, not just intense colors, but contrasting colors, variegated, and get rid of the gray, get rid of the, um, the, the crap, get, get rid of the slime, get rid of the black as well. So for one reason or another, I thought I should do nobody harm if I went to the spot that 
attracted me. Give my love to mother, and for the time being, there will not be much chance of my going back to Holland. Goodbye. And uh, that's true. He would actually never go to Holland again. Uh, he's got, uh, at this point, he's 34 years old. He's got about three years left to live, and he will never again uh, go to to uh, to Holland. He will return to Paris, though. Okay, now we are into March, 3rd of March. These are some, uh, so here are, there's blossoming almond branch in a glass, right? You can see there's color there, but it's still a little bit gray. It's still a little dull. There's a bit of, he's, he's, he's trying to bring some vibrancy to his art, but it's still pretty gray. He's trying to bring some blue into it as well. And then here is a more colorful one, blossoming almond branch in a glass with a book. And this one's a little bit more colorful. And you kind of wish that he, he would use some red, um, but can you see it's pink and green, uh, yellow and blue, right? So he's, he's getting there, he's getting there. There's quite a lot of, he, he seems to like this color, he uses this in the portrait of Dr. Gachet, these, this sort of green he uses as well. Um, but there you go. So if you ask me, not, this is not something I would really want to hang in my house, even if someone gave it to me, I would, if someone gave me that Van Gogh, I'd be like, thanks a lot, uh, where can I sell this? Uh, this is quite nice, but it's from Paris. You can see it's got a very energetic style, you know, dabbing with a brush, got very energetic style. Some reds he's using over there, um, but, but again, quite a gray sky. And then uh, let's have a look at one more. We've seen this one already, but this is a, this is one of his loveliest pictures so far. Can you can you see the energy in this landscape? It, it feels like when you look at this, you can actually see the the grass moving, um, and that that is that is quintessential Van Gogh, right? Okay, dear Theo. Um, this is 3rd of March. With great pleasure, I received your letter and the rough draft of the letter to Tierstick and the 50 franc note. Now, I imagine that Theo has actually sent a rough draft of a letter he's, he plans to send to Tierstick with his letter to Vincent, and Vincent's now going to edit the letter and critique the letter. Reminds me a little bit of Shanann Watts doing the same thing where she wrote a rough draft of a letter and then took a photo of it and, and then sent it to her friend. Can anyone remember that friend's name? Just like three or four letters. Um, it wasn't clear, but anyway, it was just a friend. Your letter to Tierstick was just right in the draft. I hope you won't have to chop it up too much when you make the fair copy. Um, it seems to me that your letter to Tierstick compliments mine. I regretted the state in which I posted it, for you will have seen that the idea of making Tierstick take the initiative in introducing the Impressionists. Um, so he's still talking about Impressionists. You can see it's made a big impression on him. Um, only came to me while I was actually writing the letter. Whereas you explain to him this idea in detail in your letter, will he understand? Hang it, it's, that's his own lookout. And then here at last, he, he mentions Gauguin. I mean, you kind of get the idea that he received the letter from Paul Gauguin, was quite excited about it, read it, saw it as a short, pretty rude letter, and then kind of tossed it aside in disgust. And then later on, maybe read it again when he was less emotional, and now he's ready to talk about it. And so... After about two weeks, he basically acknowledges that he had been sick in bed for, for a fortnight. He says that he's on the rocks since he has to pay some noisy creditors. 
that he wants to know if you have sold anything for him. That is what he wants to know. But he can't write to you for fear of bothering you. So he's kind of been appealing to Vincent to appeal to Theo on his behalf. I kind of get the idea that, that uh, and tell me I'm wrong, I kind of get the idea that what Gorga is actually trying to do here is manipulate Theo. And what I mean is, if Theo hasn't sold any of his art, then Vincent writing to Theo opens the door to the suggestion of, well, don't you think you should give Gorga some money? Don't you want to give him some pocket money? Don't you think that that's what he's angling at? Because Gorga, you, you kind of get the idea that Paul Gorga is not a very, not someone who's really going to be uh, bothered about bothering someone. And so wasn't this a strategy to get Theo, to get uh, into Theo's good books where, oh, you know, I give Vincent money all the time. Oh, uh, Gorga is also struggling with money. Well, maybe I must just give him a handout. I don't have to sell his art in order to give him money. I'll just give him some money. And I think Paul Gogol was jealously and greedily aware that Vincent was getting this free ride in his mind through life, through trying to become an artist. And, and you sort of wonder, did he um, covet that to some extent? Did, did he also want some handouts, some pocket money? Did he also want a patron in that sense? Okay, tell me, I'm going to put you down. Yeah. It makes sense, right? That 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 uh, um, Gorga is trying to use Vincent to get easy money out of Theo. Don't you get that impression? And if you don't, let's see if that is going to happen. Let's see if that is going to kind of play out. The only thing I can do in this business is to write to Russell, and I'm going to do this today. And after all, so that's that's all he says about this one paragraph devoted to Gorga, basically that he, he's got little money and he also, so he basically does what Gorga asks. He says, can you be ready to reduce the price of his paintings so that they're going to sell? He's been sick. He's got debts. He wants to know if you sold anything. He doesn't want to bother you. He has very little money. Uh, would you send him something? Then, after all, we have already tried to make tears stick by one, but what is to be done? It must be pressed hard. Would you risk taking his marine for the firm? If that were possible, I don't know what that refers to. And then he talks about these um, paintings that he's painted. He, he has, a, he has a rare insight into, I mean, we want to know what is going on on the ground in all. What is it like being there, right? Let me show you quickly another, another picture. You've seen it before, but here it is again. I uh, couldn't preview the file, okay. Anyway, that, that's all. Right, that that's the Colosseum in the background. This is all at night. That's the Colosseum in the background. And so um, he says it is freezing hard, and there's still snow in the countryside. And he talks about the study of the white landscape with the town in the background. Then he says, "So much for today." Oh, this is quite interesting. He says, despite it being freezing hard and snow. He's found an almond tree with a with a branch already in flower in spite of it. I don't know about you, but I find that uh, quite incredible that in this bleak in this bleak context where he arrives in all, it's cold, it's there's snow everywhere. He actually found finds a flower. And, and in a way, Van Gogh himself is like this diamond in the rough. He's like this flower that that shouldn't actually be there shouldn't actually exist that's passing through all that is picking up all of these amazing um impressions of the fields the bridges the rivers the 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 farms the landscapes the mountains 
and and I mean ultimately that is going to take him to to this right so so all basically predates Starry Night which which is one of the most important um, paintings in modern art right and so all is awakening his sense of of the electricity of the world around him and I've been there it was it was it turns cold it was windy you can imagine the wind uh, there's something windy about story now the way that the stars are, are doing it and, and there's a great cypress tree in the foreground when you watch the uh, animated excellent animated um, uh, movie um, loving Vincent with an animate story night, you, you see how that tree is being ruffled by the wind. You get a sense of breeze and wind and movement. Well, the, the wind is a real thing in the south of France. Uh, it's called the Mistral. And you, you um, some of my memories of all, and I've got some video of it, I'll just need to try and find it. Um, I mean, like, a courtyard built by the Romans, or, or parts of it are built by the Romans, and and um, the wind blows through there, and, and it, it creates this ghostly atmosphere. Um, there's this sort of whistling sound, and when you have a wind like that moving over the landscape, not just for one day, but like constantly. I remember when I when I mountain bike to Saint Rami. I was cycling into a block headwind. And it was terrible. It was it was this very, very, very strong wind coming from the front. So it's not just to say, oh, when you're in the south of France, in all the, you know, sometimes the wind blows. It's a it's a real force. It's like a living thing. It's a thing that makes a noise. It's a thing that ripples over the fields. It's a thing that moves the trees. And in that space, which is already beautiful and sunny, you feel your own spirit moving in the same way that the landscape is moving in front of your very eyes, the grass uh, does that. When I lay down under those grass heads at the at the at the Langlois Bridge, the 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 wind was moving the, those grass heads in the sun, and and that creates a real sense of a living planet, a, a living landscape, and that's what Van Gogh was trying to convey, and that's what he conveyed so well. So he's trying to get something from the impressionist but then take it further and that's exactly what he did is he created movement he, put, he imbued his his paintings with the spirit of life and movement um in his art right and um and that's why going to all was so important because you feel that there you, you feel just how old our civilization is there you know it's like an a thousand year old coliseum built by people that aren't there anymore. The Romans came there, built things, and, and then left. They left that stuff behind. They left behind um, uh, churches and structures in an architecture that has been superseded. And um, in that space, you, you get this marvelous feeling of, of the world, uh, that there's a transition of civilizations, that nature quietly does its thing, that the seasons come and go and, and, and the, the wind is like a reminder that there's something unspoken about this world. Maybe you want to address that, right? Uh, Mistral. It's the Mistral. That's the name of the wind in the south of France. And in fact, the movie At Eternity's Gate with... Uh, Willem Dafoe in the role of Vincent van Gogh. And there was some controversy about that movie because he's like 60 years old or something, and Vincent was supposed to be 40. So just like, how can a person who's so much older play this character? And then they said, well, yeah, well, Vincent van Gogh looked a lot older than he um than he was, and that's that's true. But then, rather have a younger actor, um, I don't know. I, I would have done it slightly differently. So the Editor's Gate 
at Eternity's Gate opens with the shutter of the Yellow House banging and the uh, bare tree branches clattering against the window. And then inside this room, with the wind blowing, because the wind's blowing so hard outside, Van Gogh paints his shoes. That's how it opens. So again, just to give you a practical sense that the wind is a real force in the south of France. It's sort of um, a, uh, a berg wind, a wind that is, is trying to move from the from inland to the sea, uh, always very close to the coast. And so as it moves, it becomes hotter and it becomes stronger. But it's a, a wind that is funneling its way through the mountains, through the Alps. And then by the time it gets to the sea, it's become quite a potent, uh, potent force. And he, he's not talking about it yet, but he's going to be talking about the wind. Uh, bear in mind, as an artist painting in in nature, um, he's, he runs the risk of his canvas being turned into a kite or his canvas being blown away, or his canvas turning into a kind of tumbleweed. Anyway, he says, so much for today. Uh, indeed, I'm very glad that you wrote to Tierstick, and I hope that this will mean a revival of your business relations with Holland. So what they're trying to do is almost turn, turn their art efforts into a kind of a multinational. Let's try and sell art in Holland. Let's try and sell art in Belgium. Let's try and sell art while well, we're already selling it in France. They're trying to create, in a way, a multinational, right? Okay, 9th of March, here is a, feels like it's a bit of Van Gogh regressing. Um, it's not quite as bad as extrament-colored potatoes, not quite as bad, but it, you know, these are supposed to be apples, and they are mostly like green apples. Uh, to me, this is not very well drawn. Um, like, if you asked me what are these, I wouldn't have said apples. In fact, I would say I don't know what I'm looking at. Are they gem squashes? So I don't think it's a terribly good um, good execution. Uh, it's better than uh, extrament colored potatoes in an extrament colored basket. It's slightly better than that. Um, he talks about something about Pissarro in his signature over here. Can you see that? Something about Pissarro. Oh, it's it's a gift to Lucien Pissarro. Well, if I was Lucien, I would um, chop up the frame and use it for firewood. This is a better still life. This is six oranges. Right, that's definitely a lot better. That's something I might even have in my home or in my kitchen. Uh, I think he could have done a bit of a better job with the oranges. Uh, if you, if you, um, you know, not focusing very much, you could even imagine these are peaches. This is executed quite well. Some some nice detail in terms of the um, the weaving of this uh, basket that is holding these oranges, and then uh, I quite like the. The, the blue contrasting with the yellow here, it's, it's, it's a simple piece, but, but quite well done. Definitely better than the previous one. And then uh, what else do we have? So that's, that's it. So let's go through this letter. 9 March are trying to get us to the end of March, or, or at least to the 15th of March. So we are on parity with where we are in 2023. My dear Theo, this morning at long last, the weather changed and turned milder. And likewise, I've already had an opportunity to learn what a mistral is. Well, there we have it. Great minds think alike, right? I've been for several walks in the country hereabouts, but it is quite impossible to do anything in this wind. The sky is a hard blue with a great bright sun, which has melted almost all the snow. But the wind is cold and so dry that it gives you goose flesh. So is that really saying, you know, when the wind passes over you, your skin even agitates, right? And can you see, this is one of the first um, 
uh, very, what's the word, very uh, precise descriptions of his experience in all for a couple of letters. And what is foremost in his mind? Well, the weather, the weather, the mistral, the wind. He talks about the great bright sun, uh, the snow is all melted, but the wind is cold and dry. He says, all the same, I've seen lots of beautiful things, a ruined abbey on a hill covered with holly, pines, and gray olives. By the way, that, that ruined abbey is a Roman, I think he's talking about a Roman um, uh, abbey with a, with a with sort of graves leading up to it. And... Um, and 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 sort of a avenue of of trees, but I actually included that in my the photos that I attached. I just can't quite find them. Let me just see. Try again. See if I can find it. Just see if I can. Uh, let's try this one. Give me a second. I'm just trying to find. See if I can find it. Try four more. This is not it, but this is quite a nice image of that bridge that he painted. Yeah, I just can't find it. There's so many images here. I just, I don't have it. I'll have to show you guys in the next letter. This is where I was lying in the grass. They, they're my shoes. And there's how the wind was blowing these grass heads. Of course, you've got to see the video to really appreciate it. Let's try one more. I'm, I'm, I really feel like I want to show you that particular image. Okay, I'll let me have, I'll try and Google it. So these are obviously not my images, um, but it's um, that's that's what he's talking about, the ruined abbey. And there's there's the avenue on the other side. Can you guys see that? So um, I um, I took some photos there. I'll try and show you in the next episode. But that is also we went with Paul Gogard. It's one of the the few spots that both of them went to, both of them painted, and obviously both of them executed in a different one. That's where it gets so exciting. You see two different artists looking at the same reality and interpreting it in a totally different way. So we're going to obviously come back to this Roman Abbey. But that's what he's talking about when he talks about the ruined Abbey. 
you can see it talks about holly, pines, gray olives. He says, we'll have a try at that soon. I be means I'm going to paint that at some stage. Then he says, I've just finished a study like the one Lucian Pissarro has of mine, but this time it is oranges. That makes eight studies so far. But this doesn't really count because I haven't yet been able to work in any comfort or warmth. So you kind of get the idea that he's um, painting. He's almost like shivering. And he's like paints and then he's like shivering and the wind's howling around him, right? Then he says, the letter from Gorgar, which I meant to send you and which I thought for the moment had got burned with other papers, I've since found and am enclosing it. Um, the fact that he says here, I thought that it might have gotten burned with other papers, it does make you wonder, did he receive that letter in disgust and, and try and burn it? Or has he been trying to keep warm by burning um, perhaps Theo's letters? Anyway, he says, I've already written direct to him and sent him Russell's address, also Gorgas to Russell, so that if they like, they can deal with each other. But how di difficult for many of us, and assuredly we ourselves are among the number, the future is. I firmly believe in the ultimate victory, but will the artists themselves gain any advantage from it? And will they see less troubled days? So he is aware that difficulties face him, and he's not the only one who's facing difficulties. He is also optimistic, ultimately, is also uh, resolute and determined to succeed. And But he wonders, are we going to see, are things going to get any easier? He says, I've bought some coarse canvas here, and it is prepared for matte effects, and I can get everything now almost at the same prices as in Paris. Saturday evening, I had a visit from two amateur artists, a grocer who sells painting materials as well, and a magistrate who seems like a nice fellow and intelligent. One does wonder if he's had any experiences or encounters with the beautiful woman of all. Um, uh, he's not mentioning it, but one does wonder. He says, worse luck, I can hardly manage to live any cheaper than in Paris. I must figure it at five francs a day. I have not yet found any sort of small place where I could have private board and lodging, but all the same, something of the kind must exist. And so he's at this point looking for what will be one of the most famous aspects associated with the Van Gogh story, the Yellow House. So we're in the pre-Yellow House phase. He's trying to find somewhere to, to settle down and to base himself in all. He says, if the weather is mild in Paris too, it will do you good. What a winter. I dare not roll up my studies yet because they're hardly dry and there are some bits of impasto which will take some time to dry. I've just finished reading Tartarin on the Alps, which amused me hugely. Let's uh, have a look at what that's all about. Sounds like an adventure story. It's also known as Tartarin of Tarason. I think as far as I can remember, there was a station on the way to all, which is Tarason. So here is a brief synopsis. Really need to change my setup here. Anyway, um, the provincial town of Tarasan is so enthusiastic about hunting that no game lives anywhere near it, and its inhabitants resort to telling hunting stories and throwing their own caps in the air to shoot at them. Tartarin, a plump middle-aged man, is the chief cap hunter, but following his, so you can see this is like a satire, but following his enthusiastic reaction to seeing an atlas lion in a traveling menagerie, the over-imaginative town understands him to be planning a hunting expedition to Algeria. So you kind of get a bit of a um, Don Quixote vibe from this, that 
there's this character in a town and he becomes the chief hunter of caps. They throw caps into the air and then there's somehow misunderstanding him into believing he's become this great uh, African hunter. To not lose face, Tartarin is forced to go after gathering an absurd mass of equipment and weapons. So they assume he's a certain kind of person and now he starts to pretend he's that kind of person. On the boat from Marseille to Algiers, he hooks up with a con man posing as a Montenegrin prince who takes advantage of him in multiple ways. So, so now you've got a con man being conned by another con man. It feels a bit like true crime on YouTube. Tartarin's gullibility causes him a number of misadventures until he returns home penniless but covered in glory after shooting a tame blind lion. So this is the kind of satire he's reading to amuse himself when he can't really paint, right? Then he says, um, so that's that's what that reference is to. Can you see how it's worth seeing what he's reading? He's just reading something that's silly, but it's about um, people who don't live in the real world getting caught up in their own nonsense, right? And he says, it amused me hugely. He says, has that confounded tear stick written you yet? All to the good if he has. If he doesn't answer, he will hear of us all the same. And we shall see to it that he can find no fault with our actions. For instance, we will send a picture to Mrs. Mo, right? Someone mentioned that, that um, a picture about almond blossoms was sent to Moe's widow. With a letter from both of us in which supposing Tearstick does not reply, we shall not say a word against him, but we will manage to convey that we do not deserve to be treated as if we as if we were dead. But in, indeed, it is not likely that Tearstick will have any prejudice against us on the whole. Now, there's another um, mention of Paul Gogar. He says, poor Gogar has no luck. I'm very much afraid that in his case, convalescence will last even longer. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, convalescence, you know, healing, recovery will last even longer than the fortnight which he has had to spend in bed. My God, shall we ever see a generation of artists with healthy bodies? Ain't that the truth? Sometimes I am perfectly furious with myself for it isn't good enough to be, well, oh, sorry, for it isn't good enough to be either more or less ill than the rest. The ideal would be a constitution tough enough to live till 80. And besides that, so can you see, that is actually what he's thinking about at this point. I, I really hope I'm going to live a long life. That's how he feels in 1888. Besides that blood in one's veins, that would be right good blood. So that's just a reference to wanting to live an authentic life, right? I want to live long and I want to live authentically. He says it would be some comfort if one could think that a generation of more fortunate artists was to come. I wanted to write to you at once that I'm in hopes winter is really over. And I hope that is the same in Paris. Now, by the way, when the winter is over, we are about to go through one of the one of the most profound moments in the history of art. Van Gogh in all, <clears throat> sorry, in all, in summer. And so we're going to see some amazing art during that period. Van Gogh in all, in summer. We're going to get something like that the following summer in Saint-Rami, but of course, is in the asylum, he's, he's, he's in a state of convalescence. So although there is some extraordinary art there, it is, um, the output is definitely limited because he's in miserable shape. And then there's the final summer in Auvers Suar. So Vincent has basically got three summers left and in all three of them, he produces um, memorable art that, that is going to be part of his legacy. So basically, when he was in Paris in summer, he painted some paintings and we don't, they don't necessarily mean that much. When he was in Antwerp in summer or whenever, doesn't really mean that much. And wherever he was before that doesn't really mean that much. The three summers that are to come 
are going to be Van Gogh's legacy, um, you know, in terms of um, modern art. Okay. And so we're about to begin that summer period. So here's another book, a book, here's another painting, and it seems to be all the uh, books that he's reading. You can see he's really accumulated a lot. Uh, I don't particularly like this painting, but there it is. And you, again, you kind of get the idea that if he's painting books, it must be really windy and miserable out there that he can't go out into the landscape. It's not that he's not working. You kind of get the feeling that he can't work because of the weather. Anyway, 10 March 1888, we are almost on parity with where we are now, 15th of March. And I think that's as far as we'll take this, uh, this live stream. Um, my dear Theo, thank you for your letter and the 100 franc note enclosed. I very much hope that you are right in thinking Tierstig will come to Paris shortly. It's very much to be desired with things in the state you say they are in. Everyone on the rocks and hard up. So again, um, you know, if you say that Van Gogh was struggling, everyone was struggling. It wasn't, it wasn't that embarrassing or humiliating that he was struggling. Everyone was. Everyone was trying to make do in their own ways. I was very much interested in what you write on the Lanchon sale and about the painter's mistress. He did some work on very great character. His drawing often reminded me much of Mauve. I don't know if we're going to be able to find this artist just with that one word, but let's see if we can. Uh, Lanson seems to, to refer to a province in, in France, unless it's Julian Lanson. Okay, it could be this. So here are a couple of I think this is a painting by Lanson. Yeah. I, well, this is August Lanson, Man Defeated by a Lion. So, yeah, that, that's one of his paintings. It seems to be a contemporary of Van Gogh, 1836 to 1885. So I presume that's who he's talking about. Let's see if there are any others. He seems to like drawing lions. We'll quickly just look at one more. Um, this seems to be... near Bazales, 1870. So that's another scene. Anyway. Okay. That's what the Lanson cell refers to, um, and then he talks about the painter's mistress. He says, his drawing often reminded me very much of Moab. I'm sorry I did not see the exhibition of his studies, and very sorry not to have seen the Villette exhibition as well. What do you think of the news that the Kaiser Wilhelm is dead? I think that's the German ruler, the German king. Will this precipitate events in France? So yeah, it's a very rare is a very rare reference in his letters to current news, to current politics, to current world history uh, playing out. The German, um, the German king dies, and he says, could this precipitate events in France? And if you think about it, about 20 years later, you would have the First World War, and it would be started by Germany. So it's an interesting question. It's doubtful, and what will the effect of all this be on the trade in paintings? 
I read that there seems to be some question of abolishing the import duties on paintings into America. Is this true? So is even thinking about America at this point, perhaps it would be easier to get a few dealers and collectors to agree to buy the impressionist paintings than to get the artists to agree to share the price of their paintings. Now, it's quite it's quite um, crazy to think that Starry Night is is currently uh, well, it belongs. It is it is exhibited in New York at the Metropolitan Museum. Can you imagine if Vincent Van Gogh went to New went to New York or went to America at any point during his life? I mean, it's unrealistic and it doesn't make sense. But if he had, how would that have changed the story? And the answer is probably it probably wouldn't have. He wouldn't have become who he because he needed to be in the south of France. He needed to be where he was. Perhaps it would be easier to get a few dealers and collectors to agree to buy the impressionist paintings. Can you see how how what a bigger deal impressionist art is on his mindset? He keeps talking about it. Nevertheless, the artist couldn't do better than to get together and give over to the association and share the proceeds of the sale so that the society could at least guarantee its members a chance to live and to work. If Degas, Claude Monet, Renoir, Sisley, and Pissarro uh, took the initiative saying, look here, we give five, give five, 10 paintings each, or rather we each give to the value of 10,000 francs to be estimated by expert members such as Tierstig and yourself, co-opted by the society, said experts likewise to put in capital in the form of paintings. You see all the art um, strategy that's going on here. I'm trying to get artists to pool their art and try and sell it in that way. Anyway, it says, we invite you others, Guli, Gulami, Serrat, Goga, to join with us and so on. Thus the great impressionists of the Grand Boulevard while giving pictures which would become general property would keep their prestige and the others could no longer reproach them with keeping to themselves the advantages of a reputation, no doubt acquired primarily through their personal efforts and individual genius, but all the same a reputation that is growing, buttressed and actually maintained by the paintings of a whole battalion of artists who have been working in perpetual poverty. So he's trying to find a way to overcome this entropy, he's trying to find a way to break through as an artist and he feels like he's got to do that with the help of other artists he wants to be associated with other artists anyway it is to be hoped that it'll come off i have two more studies of landscapes i hope that the work will go on steadily now and that in a month i shall be able to send you a first consignment i say in a month because i want to send you only the best and because i want them to be dry and because i want to send at least a dozen at a time owing to the expense of carriage. He's saying, I want to send you a dozen paintings at a time. So he's planning on churning them out, right? He says, I congratulate you on purchasing the Surat and uh, with what I will be sending you, you must try to arrange another exchange with him as well. You realize that if Tierstick joins you in this business between you two, you could easily persuade Bossard Valadon to um, grant a regular credit for the necessary purchases. But it is urgent since failing that the dealers will cut the ground from under your feet. I've made the acquaintance of a Danish artist, Maria Peters Peterson, who talks about Heyerdahl and other northerners, Kroya, etc. His work is dry, but very conscientious. Let's see if we can see what he's done. Not bad, not bad. Quite different. So that's the kind of art that he, he does. You can see it's from Southern Europe. This is a Danish artist. It feels a little, um, it feels a little like 
Gorgar in a way, but it also doesn't it look quite photographic. I, I quite like that. House and garden. Interior of a mansion with a goal with a gold sewing. That is very photographic, I must say. That's that's pretty incredible. That's that's a pretty good painting. Do you agree? I quite like that. What else? Ironing room at Holbeck Farm. That's also a beautiful picture. It's a lot better than Van Gogh is doing at this point, and arguably at any point, just in terms of skill, artistic skill. May not be terribly imaginative, but it is certainly very, very well executed. What's going on here? I hope I'm dealing with the right artist here. Yeah, it looks like it. Okay. Shall we continue? So that's just a reference to his art. And he's, he says he's, I guess he's met him in person. Uh, he says his work is dry, but very conscientious. Can you see what he means by that? It's very detailed. He's still young. Some time ago, he saw the exhibition of the Impressionist. He's probably going to Paris for the Salon and wants to make a tour in Holland to see the museums. I quite approve of your exhibiting the leaves uh, with the independence. Its title ought to be Romans Parisians. I should be so glad to hear that you managed to persuade Tierstick, but we must be patient. I do get 50 francs worth of stuff when your letter arrived. This week I shall set four or five things going. I'm daily thinking about this association of artists and the plan has developed further in my mind. But Tierstick must be in it. A lot depends on that. As a matter of fact, the artist would have Tierstick's help. Without that, we should be left listening from morning till night to the lamentations of them as a whole. And each man in particular would be everlastingly coming to ask for explanations, axioms, and so forth. I shall not be surprised if Tierstick's view <coughs> will be that we cannot do without the artists of the Grand Boulevard and that he will try to persuade them to take the initiative towards our association by giving paintings which would become common property, no longer individual. <coughs> <clears throat> I may need to go and get another glass of water. <clears throat> if they were to make the proposal, the Petit Boulevard, in my opinion, would be morally obligated to join. And these gentlemen of the Grand Boulevard will keep their present reputation only if they can forestall the not unfounded criticism of the less impressionists. Last paragraph, if Degas, Monet, Renoir, and Pissarro were to say that, even allowing plenty of margin for their individual ideas, when it comes to putting it into practice, they could do worse, if only by saying nothing at all and letting things slide. Ever yours, Vincent. So I think this is going to be the last letter. This will be the last letter for now. <clears throat> but before I get to it, I'm going to go and get a glass of water. <coughs> Tell me what you're doing. Come. What are you doing? Turn it off. Turn it off.
Okay. So here we are at last at the Langlois Bridge. Um, and look how colorful that is. So this is arguably one of his most colorful and even blue pictures that is that is painted thus far. Look how beautiful that blue is. And look how there's blue here and, and kind of orange there. Do you see that? There's even a certain amount of orange in this bridge, which is actually gray. Did you see a mouse? Just want to see if I've got another picture of that bridge. Worth sharing, I guess. I mean, the bridge in his picture is down. The bridge in mine is up. Um, for some reason, it's not allowing me to just open open it. Very strange. Oh, um, I have to look for it here. Um, there it is, and there it is. Actually, purposefully try to get this flower to con this. It's a lavender sort of colored flower, but I purposely wanted a black background to to show it. So, so that was done on purpose. But there are a couple of other. Where's that one? Where it's in, right in front of that bridge. Can't quite find it. I've got it here, but there's something kind of going wrong with. I think I've got too many images open or something. Anyway. Anyway, do you agree? That is a, it's a really beautiful uh, th that is maybe one of his most beautiful paintings thus far, right? And there's also something kind of cartoonish about it. It's it's not impressionism. It's something else. Do you see that? And you can see it's early spring. These poplars are either just about a bud or they, they are still bare. And uh, I, I kind of get the idea that Van Gogh must have enjoyed this scene. I mean, these are all women washing and he must have quite liked watching them. Anyway, he says, let's hear what he says about it. My dear Theo, I thank you very much for your letter, which I had not dared to expect so soon, as far as the 50 franc note which you added was concerned. I see that you have not yet had an answer from Tearstick. So they're appealing to Tearstick for his um, interest, and he doesn't seem to be terribly interested. Bear in mind they've had arguments in the past with him. I don't think that we need to press him with a new letter. However, if you have any official business to transact with in The Hague, you might mention in a PS that you are rather surprised that he, he has in no way acknowledged the receipt. You kind of get the sense that they need him, right? Then he says, um, as for my work, I brought back a size 15 canvas today. It is a drawbridge over which passes a little cart standing out against a blue sky. So, 
you know, what's really important to emphasize here is he's not just painting a scene. He's not just painting uh, uh, a river or a bridge. He's actually painting the human um, activities around it. He's painting a cart crossing over the bridge while people are washing clothes underneath. In other words, he's capturing that little moment in quite a tender way, in, in quite a almost mischievous way. Um, look at this little scene in the countryside where a cart crosses over a bridge and people are washing clothes underneath it. It is a very charming thing to say, isn't this worth looking at? You know, isn't this something? And then here's, a, here's a even more colorful representation. And this is slightly different. There's a boat, I think, in this picture. The same washing going on. Different bridge and a different kind of scene in the background. Look how this is probably his most colorful picture to date. That's saying quite a lot. Um, blue blues, uh, th this picture, like I said previously, kind of feels like the American flag, red, white, and blue. Lovely, right? Then he says, um, there's a group of women washing linen in smocks and multicolored caps and another landscape with a little rustic bridge and washerwoman also. Finally, an avenue of plane trees close to the station. Um, so that's also quite quite a good picture. <clears throat> the weather here is changeable, often windy with turbulent skies. And he's actually painted um, a lot of turbulent skies in all and, and um, Sahami, you see the clouds doing that. But the almond trees are beginning to flower everywhere. I'm happy, I'm very happy that the paintings are going to the independence. You're right to go to see Sinyak at his house. I was very happy to read in today's letter that he made a more favorable impression on you than the first time. In any case, I'm glad to know that after today, you will not be alone in the apartment. Not quite sure what that means. Does that mean he's with Joe Bonga? I'm not quite sure exactly what that means. Remember me kindly to Quinning. Are you well? I'm better myself, except that eating is a real ordeal. Remember he's had problems with his teeth. I've had a touch of fever and no appetite, but it's only a question of time and patience. So it seems he's actually ill as well. And what do you think he's ill with? And, and um, I think you can start to say from this point onwards, whenever he seems to have fever, whenever he's ill, whenever he's weak, what do you think is going on? Do you think he's going mad? Or do you think it's just the totally predictable, obvious evolution of... Uh, a sickness that he's, he's had since Paris, since Antwerp even. Uh, Lisa Breck, thanks for joining us. I agree with that, yeah. Okay, I have company in the evening for the young Danish painter who is here is a decent soul. His work is dry, correct and timid, but I do not object to that when the paint is young and intelligent. He originally began studying medicine. He knows Zola, de Goncourt, Gaida, Montpassant, and he has enough money to do himself well. And with all this, a very genuine desire to do very different work than what he's producing now. So it seems like Van Gogh is looking at his art, which I think is pretty awesome, and he's saying, you know, you're young, you, you'll, you'll still improve. <laughs> I think he would be wise to delay his return home for a year or to come back here after a short visit to his friends. But my dear brother, you know that I feel as though I am in Japan. I say no more than that. And I still haven't seen anything in its usual splendor yet. Um, this style of painting in a cartoonish way is actually something that, that other artists picked up from the Japanese. Um, it, it's kind of a 
um, long ago version of anime. You know, anime is a sorry, not anime, anime. Anime is a particular kind of Japanese animation. Well, in the same way, the Japanese prince was painting in a way that resembles rea reality, but but in a cartoonish style. And you get the idea that Van Gogh was um, to some extent copying that here and there. That's why, even though I'm vexed that just now expenses are heavy and the painting's worthless, that's why I don't despair of the future success of this idea of a long sojourn in the midi. Uh, here I am seeing new things. I'm learning. If I take it easy, my body doesn't refuse to function. So he also knows how to recover. If he's not feeling well, if he, if he goes to the brothel less often, if he drinks less, if he sleeps more, if he treats himself better, then he knows how to recover from that. My, for many reasons, I should like to establish some sort of little retreat with the poor cab horses of Paris, that is yourself and several of your friends, the poor impressionists could go out to pasture when they get too exhausted. So there's giving kind of a farmyardy feel to himself and his brother, that we are like animals in a pasture, we need a break. I was present at the inquiry into a crime committed at the door of a brothel here. Quite interesting. So you say, uh, Van Gogh has got nothing to do with true crime. Um, he doesn't know anything about it. Well, here you have it. Um, a crime committed at the door of a brothel. What do you think he was doing present at the door of the brothel? Right? What do you, how do you think he was able to witness that? Two Italians killed two Zouaves. I took advantage of the opportunity to go into one of the brothels in a little street called Des Recollets. And so now he's actually telling us what he's really up to. This is the extent of my amorous adventures among the Arlesians, the mob all but the mob, all but the southerner, like Tartarin, being more energetic in good intentions and in action. In action, the mob, I repeat, all but lynched the murderers locked up in the town hall. But in retaliation, all the Italians, men and women, the Savoyard monkeys included, have been forced to leave town. So um, he arrives at this, this little town, quaint little town, only to experience some pretty crazy behavior. Um, you can imagine that there's different it's a cosmopolitan crew just like in it was in Antwerp and and uh, people are drinking and boozing and sleeping with women and fighting with one another right yeah a good point seeing new things like like that I should have I should not have told you about this except that it means I've seen the streets of this town full of excited crowds it was indeed a fine sight and you kind of get the idea that he doesn't want to tell his brother that he's going to brothels. He is, but he doesn't want to say so. I made my last three studies with the perspective frame, which you know I use. I attach some importance to the use of the frame because it seems not unlikely to me that in the near future, many artists will make use of it, just as the old German and Italian painters certainly did. And as I'm inclined to think the Flemish too, the modern use of, of it may differ from the ancient practice, but in the same way, isn't it true that in the process of painting in oils, one gets very different effects today from those of the men who invented the process? And the moral of this is that it's my constant hope that I'm not working for myself alone. I believe in the absolute necessity of a, this is really important. I believe in the absolute necessity of a new art of color, right? A new art of color, of design, and of the artistic life. And if we work in that faith, it seems to me that there is a chance that we do not hope in vain. You must know that I'm actually ready to send some studies off to you, and only it is impossible to roll them up yet, because they haven't dried. Um, a hearty handshake on Sunday, I shall write to Bernard and de Lutrec. 
because um, I solemnly promised to, and I shall send you those letters as well. I'm deeply sorry for Gogar's plight. So I'm, I'm sorry about his financial situation and he can't, you can't sell his art, especially because his health is shaken. He's no longer, he, he no longer has the kind of temperament that profits from hardships. And you, you kind of imagine that Van Gogh does have that kind of temperament. On the contrary, this will only exhaust him from here on and that will spoil him for his work. Goodbye for the present, ever yours, Vincent. And so we just passed two, two and a half hours. I'm going to stop at this point. Uh, we'll deal with this letter on the 18th of March next. It's a letter to Emile Bernard. With a couple of other letters and sketches and so on to look forward to. You can see his return to the Langlois Bridge. I'll try and do a better job of um, putting the photos I want to show you on this computer, because they're actually on another one. And when I email them, and there are a lot of emails, you can't you can't um, uh, get to them as easily. So I'll try and uh, do that. I want to sort of play out with um, some some more um, material from Painted with Words. So let's have a quick look at that. So this is obviously a scene in all modern all or modern day all, but 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 a road you can see it's cobbled cobbled streets and let's see what we can see so these are some of the artworks that he produces you notice the hat So um, Mel says Van Gogh is very familiar with stoicism and self-sacrifice. He is. Thanks a lot, Zircon. So, so this is where we are. We are um, about to begin our first summer with Van Gogh in he, the yellow period. We really falls in love with the color yellow. He falls in love with the sun. He falls in love with color. He falls in love with, in a way, the landscape. The, va the landscape, this is vibrates in front of him. And so, um, you know, right where we are now, you guys are in America, it's March. Um, and so we're going to go, as you go, uh, certainly in terms of the next letter, we're going to be going into the early stages of spring with Van Gogh and try and... Um, uh, anticipate that journey in the same way that you are about to enter your summer, it's starting to get cold here in South Africa. We're going to try and enjoy summer the way that Van Gogh did in the, you know, the third last summer of his life uh, and see the colors around us the same way that he did, right? Let's play a little bit more from uh, Painted with Words. So that's 5th of July, 1888. We're jumping a bit forward in time. And I think what he's doing there is he's missing, he's starting to feel lonely, he's starting to wonder. Is, I think at some point he invites Paul Gogar to come stay with him and Paul Gogar now needs to decide whether he will. I really don't know what this is about. Um, I guess I guess we could go to the letter 5th of July and, and see what it's about. Well, I think he's lonely. I think this is about him. He's trying to sell his art and he's in another little town. And I can tell you, um, all is, is a very pretty town. It's a very romantic place. They're really old buildings. The landscape's beautiful, and it is a place, because it's so pretty, because it touches you, you you can feel very lonely because you sort of feel like something this pretty, something this stunning. Um, what a shame not to share that with somebody. And that is, I think, exactly how he feels. He wishes he can um, share 
what he's feeling, what he's seeing, what he's experiencing with somebody else. And that's why he starts to feel increasingly desperate that Paul Goga must join him. Um, as, as much as he likes painting where he is, he wants to share that with someone. He is feeling lonely. Bear in mind, he doesn't have a girlfriend. He's, he's um, um, sexual experiences are all, I guess, paid for. You know, so that also means it's not a very. It, it, he wants a, a rich, deep experience of life and of love, but he he can't get that because of his because he's not successful because he's not. Um, well dressed because he, he doesn't appear to be someone of any substance. Terry, uh, thanks a lot for for joining us. Um, Gloria says it's cold and snow in Buffalo in the twenties. Enough already. Yeah. Well, every day that passes, it's going to get a little bit better. Have you seen the old movie with Kurt? I've seen some of it. it. It's hard to watch because it's so clumsily done. But especially where he cries in the cafe uh, in in um, uh, what's it? The 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 Ravu Inn. You know that scene where he is everyone celebrating Bastille Day, and he suddenly starts crying because he's so lonely. It just is very unrealistically done. Even the way that he dramatizes how he cuts off his ear is, you, when you see that, you should realize how unre unrealistic it is. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Yvonne. Okay, so I want to just thank you guys for being at such short notice. I didn't really give you much of a heads up, but I'm trying to do these Van Gogh letters uh, every two or three days, every two, three, four days. So basically two a week, at the beginning of the week, middle of the week, end of the week. That, that's that's sort of the idea. Um, so, yeah, um, you should keep your eyes peeled. Um, I'm planning on putting up part two of the Magellan uh, epic. And although I originally was just going to do the second half of it, I, I thought I will do it in three episodes. So you've, you've heard the first one. The second one culminates with the Battle of, uh, is it Maktan? Um, and what's fascinating there, there is the way we see that battle and the way the Filipinos see it. We see it as a great tragedy that Magellan is murdered or killed or dies in battle. And they see it as the guy who killed him is, is, the great, is a great hero. Uh, well done, right? I mean, Magellan's trying to find a way around the world. Um, this guy murdered him. Woo -hoo! It's, it's kind of a weird way of thinking about it. But then you must also think that Magellan wasn't wasn't necessarily. He was regarded as a colonizer by the people that were being colonized, right? And so that, this is the reality of that. So, yeah, I'll be doing um, that episode as the second one and the middle part of the narrative. And then the final one deals with the final leg and returning home. And, and then ultimately, what does happen to the ship, Victoria? After it goes around the world, what happens? Where can you see the first ship to go around the world? Where can you sort of go to a museum and, and look, wow, this is the first. You now, where can you do that? So we're going to deal with that as well. Again, uh, thanks, thank you guys for joining me on this uh, pretty impromptu live live stream. I'm trying to grow this channel. I'm trying to. I, I've, I've got to. I, I need to get to a thousand subscribers by the end of this month, and then also four thousand hours viewed. And I'm only at about a thousand three hundred. So. Um, I'm hoping you guys are going to continue watching these videos, sharing them, and hopefully other people will be subscribing as well. I also want to share with you guys um, my very first photojournalism sortie. So I found some old photos of, um, of photography I did on my very first 
photojournalism job for a magazine called Heartland. And so I'll be sharing that with you guys as well. Hope you're enjoying this. Uh, keep sending me your photos and uh, uh, keep weaving. And Timmy says, see you guys next time. Ciao.